Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Bienvenidos a un nuevo taller de Madrid in Game. Es el taller número 18. Eh, y esta es la única parte en la que voy a hablar en español, porque como ya hemos anunciado por redes sociales, hoy tenemos con nosotros la suerte y el placer de tener con nosotros a Dave Martin de la British Sports. Así que va a ser toda la reunión en inglés, toda la, toda la sesión en inglés, pero bueno, ya sabéis, eh, os, os comentamos en redes sociales que Dave, Dave tiene un, un inglés perfecto, con lo cual yo creo que cualquiera que sepa un poquito de inglés lo va, lo va a entender. Así que si me permitís, como vamos a arrancar o como ya hemos arrancado, pues voy a cambiar al inglés y a partir de aquí pues, pues lo haremos en inglés, ¿vale? Si alguien tiene preguntas eh, y se atreve a hacerlas luego en, en inglés, pues fa faltaría más. Si no se atreve y las quiere hacer en español, pues que las deje en el chat, ¿de acuerdo? Y yo eh, las traduzco y no, hay, y no hay ningún problema, ¿vale? Así que, nada, damos, damos paso a la última persona que se estaba uniendo, ¿vale? Vemos que termine de, de unirse, que está por aquí Enrique uniéndose, creo que ya está unido, ¿vale? Y ahora sí ya hacemos el switch al inglés. Uh, hello, Dave, how are you doing? Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, great to see you again, my friend. Really well, really, really well. Uh, sun shining. Beautiful wow. weather here in England. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, so what I was saying before that I was speaking in Spanish is that uh, we are really grateful to have you with us here today. Uh, this is the 18th uh, workshop that we do with Madrid in Game. You know that Madrid in Game, it's um, like an initiative that the government from Madrid uh, um, is 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 taking about the not only esports but about the, about gaming, etc. And uh, we are doing a lot of workshops in order to let the people and professionals understand what's going on in the esports industry. Uh, people who it's already on the on the on the on the field, or maybe people that wants to enter into the into the industry and they want to understand what's going on, right? So um, what I was saying is that um, and the way we have published this this uh, workshop uh, in the in the social networks is we are going to have a meeting with the British Esports, which is a I was going to say British Esports Association, but you will tell us later why it's not yet. Uh, it's a British Esports Association. It's now British Esports Federation. The 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 fact of changing this kind of of uh, of uh, naming, it's not a, it's not a coincidence. I, I I suppose that it has a meaning, right? So we we can discuss it later. But the the first question and the way we are going to do this workshop is like a like a meeting uh, between between you and me. Uh, you will be talking more than me because you will be answering the questions, obviously, but I will be here with you. So the first thing, if uh, I don't know if if anyone who is here or who, who will see the video later, I don't know if they know about the British eSports, but the first uh, way to start should be, Dave, tell us what's the British eSports. Yeah, sure. So um, the British eSports Federation is a not-for-profit uh, organization that was set up in 2016 to... Um, to do some really important things. Um, and it was set up because uh, our founder, Chester King, who is prom you know, incredibly prominent uh, in the esports space, his young son, uh, was not participating necessarily in sport, but was playing a lot of video games mm -hmm. and playing those games online uh, and you know running through communication and doing lots of different things. And Chester, as a father to his son, wanted to take a look at it. And understand what this was all about so he spoke to latimer and said latimer king and said what is it you're doing at the moment he said look i'm playing this game i'm playing online my friends i'm playing in this mini tournament and um you know he, he wanted to know more about it he saw the kind of communication that was going on the winning and losing the resilience build up and he likened that to his experience of sport so chester played rugby uh, he plays tennis a number of different things And so, well, actually, I, I do see some similarities here in terms of team games. Mm -hmm. So the first thing, the kind of very next thing he did, sorry, was to say, well, okay, if I want Latimer to be more involved in esports and maybe get training and maybe know about where the future holds for careers, what is there out in the ecosystem in the UK and globally at the moment? Of course, he found very little back in kind of 2015, 2016. So Chester being Chester said, well, look, if there's nothing there for my son, maybe I should uh, maybe I should do something. Maybe I should look at the models of sport in terms of what they do in associations and federations and think about whether or not we can put a structure in place. So he went to the government in uh, late 2015 uh, to ask to use the name British Esports Association. And um, that was approved in 2016 and the British Esports Association was launched. 
And it's been launched to do three things. Um, it's been launched to promote esports, promote the benefits of esports, not just to uh, to players in terms of you know all the things we've just discussed, but also to promote the benefits of esports to UK PLC, what it means to the government to have a new, growing, fast-growing industry potentially uh, available to it. Um, but it's it's also there um, to promote to to parents of us the, the values and the opportunities that esports provides. Um, and then there was a, a level of improve, and that's kind of thinking about standards. So standards of coaching, standards of education, standards of kit and equipment and access to that kit and equipment um, in the UK. You know, when we looked around in that kind of period, there weren't many champions. The champions were in Korea and in the US and in parts of Europe, but there weren't really any champions in the UK at world level. So we said, well, actually, if we improve all of these standards, if we can get better coaching and think about all the things that players would need and build up that ecosystem, then maybe we can create those inspiring future heroes. So the third bit, that inspire, you know, how do we get those kind of inspirational people uh, uh, there and the world champions of tomorrow that in the same way as, you know, you do and we do in sport, those heroes that you see are the ones that often young people aspire to be moving forward. So if they're seeing a, you know, I'm always careful about where I cross over in kind of football because, you know, depending on which team you are, I can kind of tread. But when you think of uh, the Spanish team that went, went through, a football team, that went through an incredible incredible period of success in the late kind of noughties into the 2010s with World Cups and Euro Championships. And you had, you know, uh, for the first time, as I noticed, like Madrid and Barca players kind of in a team playing together. You've got, you know, Ramos and uh, Xavi and Iniesta, and then you you had all the other players around it, Villa, David Villa, and those kind of people. Um, they became the heroes that people aspired to be, and that's what we wanted to do in terms of the inspiration side of things. So, so that's that's why we were founded. That's amazing. Um, I, 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 can you can you let me know if you are seeing my, the screen of the yes. where, where, yeah. where I'm showing the British Sports website? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Sorry. No. Go ahead, go ahead, please. I think okay. you were going to say something else. <laughs> so once we'd kind of set the framework of what we wanted to do, we wanted to put some key programs in, Raphael. So I'm just going to go into those a little bit. The kind of what's core to what we do at British Esports. So okay. when we when we think about um, a number of things we're doing, we, we're starting to look at, uh, first thing, student championships. So we said to ourselves, we want to have a place for young people at school and college to be able to create teams in the same way as they would do sport and then compete in a, a student championship, school versus school, college versus college, to win cups and medals at the end of the event. Not money, but this is about representation of your team in the same way as we would do in traditional sport. So we launched the student championships uh, five years ago to a very small number of teams, probably I think it was eight teams, um, not a big number. Now, today we've got you know, 600 teams, uh, thousands of competitors across hundreds of schools and colleges. Uh, and it's growing, you know, exponentially year on year. And I'll come on to a deal that I talked to you about earlier, a partnership that I think will only expand the amount of people and participants that get involved in that. So Student Champs is core to our DNA in terms of what we do, because it's where talent can go. It's where it can develop. It's where it can compete its first real competition. We run a LAN event with it, so that might be the first time they've ever played on a stage. And what we're starting to see now is talent coming through there and coming into some of our uh, professional teams. So we had a player recently who went and joined Guild Esports. We've had players who've joined other esports organisations. And we've also had them come through our schools and colleges who've ended up representing national teams. So it's becoming a conveyor belt for talent development, but it's also their first step into uh, I, I would say live competitive gaming. And it's also one that we want to make sure that we fill them full of education. We talk to them, not just about grinding the game and playing the game. This is about health and nutrition and wellness and hydration and rest and recovery and all those really beneficial things that are not only going to make you a better player on the day, but also in, enhance and expand your career length. Because we know esports professionals tend to burn out pretty quickly. 
a lot of that is to do with the fact that all of the things that surround traditional sport around health and wellness and extension of your career are quite new to esports at the moment. So we put that into our college and school communications about making sure that that's important. We also advocate the importance of sport because we, you know, we believe in the values of sport as well. And we also talk to them about education and making sure that they're in that space. But what esports does, as you know, is it allows, you know, uh, boys and girls to play together. It allows you, you know, dependent on, you know, your ability, whether you have physical uh, challenges for ability or mental challenges for ability, it allows you to still to find a place to compete. And it's a lot more of a level playing field in terms of where it is. So that's the student championships. Um, the very next thing we did was to say, actually, we've noticed that we've got a, a huge amount of people who are very interested in gaming and esports. How do we turn that passion into uh, um, an education program that not only gives them skills they need for these careers, but also wider careers, but develops the talent of tomorrow from a business perspective? So we developed uh, a BTEC with Pearson. Now, this is really important. This is not about making you a better player or finding the player tomorrow. This is about business skills, entrepreneurship, digital market, marketing, creative. This is about readying somebody for a career in esports so that when the industry, and, and as it continues to grow, um, is ready, we can find talented people because we know that if we create that talent pool, they are the entrepreneurs of tomorrow who set up these co uh, companies they are where the talent is so that companies find themselves drawn to those locations and they grow out. But also really importantly, not every one of those individuals will go on uh, to work in the esports industry. So those skills are transferable across multiple industries, but also really importantly, they're educating themselves around something they're really passionate about. And we recognize that passionate young people who get into uh, digital skills and, and creative skills will take on more learning and really enhance themselves moving forward. So we're very proud of that. Again, started with a pilot three years ago. We had 40 students in a number of colleges. We are now uh, over 4,000 students on our intake for this year at nearly 100 colleges. So 4,000 16 to 18 year olds and another couple of thousand that are already on program doing year two studying the business of esports in the UK right now from a zero base three years ago. Um, and then there have been the kind of mainstays of what we've done for a period of time. And then, as you know, and I think there have been a few announcements about it recently, um, we said, OK, we've got these pillars that are really important. Where do we uh, where do we have as a home in sport? A lot of a lot of places will have training facilities. They'll have educational facilities. In the UK for football, we have St. George's Park in the Midlands, which is where the England youth players, uh, male and female play, where the um, where the England national teams, men and female, will train and prepare, where coaches and referees come to train. So we said we want to do that. So um, two year, sorry, a year ago, we purchased a property in Sunderland, which is in the north of England, um, to create uh, a national esports performance campus. Uh, that one property has now become three properties, Raphael. So we're going to have an arena right next to something called the Stadium of Light, which is a, a very large football ground uh, for Sunderland Football Club. It has 50,000 seats in it, uh, but it usually has 40,000 people uh, there every week. We're going to have three gaming houses where teams can come and boot camp and train and use those facilities. And then we are um, uh, also having a business hub which will blend uh, gaming culture and fun with things like 100 LAN with an incubator and accelerator for business and talent development. And that's all around the Sunderland uh, space. Within 10 minutes of each other, you'll have this incredible campus, which will be a focal point for schools, colleges, esports organizations, anybody who wants to kind of get connected to the esports ecosystem to come to and feel like it's a home for them. So that's going to be our, our mini St. George's Park, which is fantastic. And then, of course, we have a number of other uh, projects and programs we're incredibly proud of. We do a lot of outreach in kind of armed forces. We do out, so we set up the RAFs, the Royal Air Forces 
um, esports um, entity, helping them combat loneliness. We've done a lot of work in challenging schools with children with challenging behaviour. And um, we have a, a great Women in Esports initiative, which is about having a programme to uplift and inspire young women to follow in the footsteps of the amazing women that are in esports at this particular moment in time, some of which work with me on a day-to-day -day basis, people like Billy uh, Purdy, uh, Alice Lehman, and people who've come before, Jasmine Hong and uh, Bryony as well. Uh, so, yeah, we've, you know, these are the kind of core things we're doing and many more things besides. Uh, Rafa, you're on mute. Sorry, because I, I was I was mute and I couldn't find the, the way to unmute the, the, the microphone. So that's really amazing. Uh, you have talked about a lot of things that you have been doing through the different years. I don't know, when was the British Sea Sports founded? 2016. 2016. So that's uh, seven years right now in the field, which is too much for the eSports. But uh, we, we are going to, to talk about the different stages and the different things that you have already mentioned. But the first one, which is for me uh, quite important, is because... When you are growing and things are are going well and you are doing things well, you can grow, right? But the, the very first moments are the hard ones, right? And I always say that you have achieved something that uh, not many countries have achieved. For sure, here in Spain, we have not uh, been able to achieve this. In fact, uh, I don't know if we are one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have any kind of representative association as yours, right? Uh, which is something we tried. There, there was an attempt here in Spain, but it didn't work, probably because it was not uh, focused or presented in the correct way. So one of the things that I want to ask, because I know the answer, and I think it, it can be very illustrative for the people that it's following us today, it's when you started, how, how was your approach? In the sense that you have talked about uh, looking for talent, uh, competitions now you have your own place for looking for this talent etc etc but at the very beginning you were more focused on schools and you had the support of the government which is as i say something that at least here in spain we have not achieved and i'm afraid we are not going to achieve in 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 many years obviously there are exceptions like like this one like madrid in game right but in terms of uh, ministries or something like this uh, th usually there is no no real push here in Spain. I know that you have the support of your government. So my 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 next question would be, how did how did you achieve this? How did you approach to the government? What did you tell them in order for them to understand that uh, supporting the esports was going to be something uh, valuable for the country? Yeah, great great question. And I think this is where many federations can get it wrong. I think you know, in the initial phases of setup, we as a, an esports community are, are very, uh, I don't want to say nervous, but we're very wary when federations and other bodies are established. Uh, so when we started this process, we, the first thing we did was take a whole lot of advice from the UK esports ecosystem and from the gaming e ecosystem. So, we didn't we we were respectful of what came before us, who was in the ecosystem before us, what the publishers wanted, and we gathered a board of incredible individuals. Um Michael O'Dell, Odie, um definitely a shout out to him. Um Garvey, Mark Handela from Twitch. So Od Odie um uh, founded uh, Team Dignitas. That, that went to the Philadelphia 76ers and has done a wonderful job up until recently with Rec Global, with Rogue and the London Royal Ravens. Um, and then you've got Garvey, who's kind of, you know, old school Twitch. Uh, Paul Challoner, a red eye. Uh, he did a lot a lot of work in the consultancy space. Um, and, um, and then also talking to some of the key publishers. And what we became aware of is what you don't want to do is try and own and control any space and particularly in the pro space so so we did that first and we took that can that we took that kind of uh brilliant advice by those amazing people on and we stand on the shoulders of those people who helped us in those early stages there's no doubt about it um and then 
once we got to that position, we went to the government and we went with uh, a very gentle um, but persuasive style of conversation with them, which was we recognise that the UK and has a, an incredible gaming industry. We also recognise that this thing called esports is growing globally and that many, uh, many parents, many uh, uh, stakeholders, sports bodies, different people are wary of this gaming world and, and what it might do, uh, where it might have implications for their sport, for their children, whatever that's going to look like. And we kind of went in with that education element of saying, well, actually, there's a we have a, an obligation and want to make sure that we educate people as to the benefits of this. But we also align that with the fact that we recognise that this industry was a, a growing industry and that as a government that it would want to be able to understand more about it and therefore participate in the opportunities that an East, uh, being involved in esports would provide, for instance, like having infrastructure that can bring some of the biggest game publishers in the world to events, like having teams and starting to develop businesses that can bring in inward investment to the UK. So there was a lot of kind of long conversations with government, helping them understand, really helping them educate, because as you can imagine, Raphael, it's the old conversations. Well, we don't like this. They should be reading books. They shouldn't be playing video games all day long. You know, we're worried about addiction, all of those conversations. So we had to go through lots of conversation, lots of education. And for that costs a lot of time and takes time and money, visiting them, time that you're not operating in other businesses. But it was worth it because then you are in a position where people actually understand who you are and what you're trying to achieve. So we're balancing the esports community and the government and in the middle kind of parents and other stakeholders all with legitimate concerns about what esports would do um but of course taking the time to explain and walk them through it and sometimes walk them through it more than once so they understood it fully was absolutely worthwhile and i would say to any federation if you're going to do that be clear about that don't go after kind of professional teams and publishers think about grassroots Think about the key stakeholders and support them. That that's amazing. I mean, probably one of the the mistakes that we committed when when we when when people here in Spain tried to to push the esports into the into the government, etc., because they were start they started saying that uh, or they started comparing it to the traditional uh, sports, right? Spe specifically football. Yeah. And you know that, you know, because you are in the UK, we are in Spain, these are two countries with pretty much tradition in in, in, in traditional sports, especially football. Uh, when you try to touch something that has been, uh, I don't know, uh, yeah. so popular for many years and you try to compare this with eSports, etc., I think that the way of proceeding was not the correct one. It, it was a nonsense to compare the eSports with, the, with football or whatever. Even if we were growing, if we, even if we had uh, good uh, figures in terms of uh, audiences, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that was a nonsense. And and my my feeling is that the, the the mistake that we made was trying to focus it in this way. So I, I think that, that the the correct way of going, or at least you have demonstrated that it, it has gone pretty well, is the way you you followed. So uh, congratulations because. It's a, and, it's, a, it's a really cool one. Yeah. And Rafa, in the early stages, we said that. We said, we're, we're not here to compete with sport. We recognise its classification that's, as that's a game. That's absolutely important. Yeah, and we want to make sure that when we talk about esports, we also talk about physical fitness, sport, and education, because those things are really important. So if we're saying to a parent, look, uh, we're not saying do this or this. We're saying... If you want to do sport, you should do sport, and this is available too. But for some people who can't do sport, that, then this is the thing that they would want to do. But we were so we very early set out our stall to say we're not going to try and classify as a support. We're not, you know, we recognize where we are. Um, obviously, that's now, Rafa, because of what's happening with the IOC and the Commonwealth and different things. They're now coming to us and saying, well, actually, we think you might want to have this conversation about classification because of where it's going. But that's really down to the fact that we didn't push too hard. Because like you say, if we'd pushed too hard, I think the doors would have been closed on us straight away. That's the point. And, 
another important point well it, it, it's it's already related with this i don't want to 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 make a step uh, to the next one yet what about the parents uh, this is this is extremely important uh, what do parents uh, thought about um, about their, their sons and daughters making or having extra classes or whatever related with 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 playing video games which is something that i don't know in the uk but for example here in spain if you tell the fathers etc no i mean your 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 son your daughter is going to yeah. have an extra class playing video games the, the first thought that they would come to their minds it's like this is a waste of time. I mean, uh, what are you trying to do then? They are only going to waste time and maybe, I don't know, uh, they, they, they they tend to think about uh, not silly things, but they have they, they see it as a danger in the sense that as in the sense of what are they going to learn? Uh, who are they going to talk to? What's going to happen with them? So how is how was the approach to, to the fathers? Yeah, yeah. So uh, definitely in the early stages, you know, lots of concern and you know if we think about when we were really starting to get up and running which is kind of 2018 the fortnight the game came out and there were a lot of concerns from parents at that point right around how much time young boys and girls predominantly young boys were playing spending on uh fortnight and there were stories coming out of kids not coming out of their bedrooms and doing different things so on the back of all that here's us trying to promote playing video games as a valuable proposition. Here's what we did is we started by educating parents around a few things. One was around the kind of format of the games, what games are rated in what way, how games take place, how um, we can utilize the Federation to educate people around being safer online, behavioral uh, online as well, you know, helping young um uh, individuals not be too toxic you know not not be um rude to young women or all of the things that can happen in toxic online environments not just gaming in social media as well so we, we had we had this opportunity to kind of do that piece of education uh, and we did that we also talked to parents because a lot of parents felt like they were losing their children and not finding a place to communicate with them so we actually we actually brought some parents together and said, why don't you, if you want to build a relationship with your son or daughter, why don't you learn the game they're playing? And they found that once they learned the game they're playing, you know, they were sat then with their son or daughter and they built a rapport in something they were passionate about, which opened into other conversations. Maybe they were unhappy at school. Maybe they had other problems going on in their lives that they wanted to talk about. So so there was that element of it. But really importantly as well, we we really pushed hard on the fact that uh, esports is about human versus human, not human versus game. So it's about team-based games and it's about everything in moderation, but the team-based element for it. So when extracurricular activities happen like esports tournaments, uh, our colleges let the students lead on what they're doing. So on development of team name, on development of maybe a top and merchandise, thinking about selection, who's going to coach the team, how are the play rotations, analytics, all those kind of things. And we started to show those back to the parents again. Oh, wow, I didn't realize that. I thought you just turned up the controllers and headsets on and played for two hours. You're telling me they're actually thinking about strategy. And now they're thinking about forming a team and you know, looking at the commercial viability. And the, it suddenly opened up into something. However, it's still challenging, Raphael, but I think a turning point for us was the pandemic. Uh, because I think parents, everyone, we we're all busy in our lives, running around, going to meetings everywhere, doing what we're going to do. And suddenly the, the world closes down and you see everything your children do. Right? I've got three of them. You suddenly realize what they're, where they're happy, where they're not happy, uh, where they find their peace, where they find their communications, where they find their friend bases. And esports was the almost the only thing that was happening that was still allowing for team play during the pandemic because they could do it from home. They didn't need to be on a football pitch. Didn't need to be on a tennis court or a basketball field. They could actually, or a basketball court, they could actually play. And parents are watching their kids start to game and perhaps getting involved in those games a little bit more and starting to see that actually that's really good. And I have a lot of stories of people saying, my, my son or daughter who plays video games is dealing with the pandemic a lot better than my son or daughter who just plays sport because they can't get out and play sport. 
they're, they're disconnected from their friends. They're not doing those. So that started to turn the, that around a little bit. But also from the education perspective, I think it's really important. Uh, we all watched our kids uh, and we understood more about what they were enjoying or not in their education. And the reason I say that is, is that as a father right now, what happens is I, I work, you know, lots of hours. I'm not in the school to see whether my daughter is, uh, son or daughter is happy or not. When I had to work from home, I saw that my daughter really was not happy in maths. So I could do something about that. I could actually support. And what we actually saw is a lot of, uh, particularly students of 16 and above, where they're doing college studies and different things, studying educational programs that they thought they should be studying, but really struggling with them and not being happy with them. And parents realizing that education being incredibly important, but if you're not happy in trying to educate yourself, you're not going to do very well at it. So we had a number of them turn to do the BTEC, the business BTEC in esports. And suddenly they're doing all the things that they wanted them to do, but contextualizing something they're passionate about. So all of these things came together to really help turn the mindset. Now, I'm not saying that tomorrow every parent on, on the planet thinks that esports is a good thing. But I think a lot more of them recognize, one, the difference between esports and traditional video gaming, but also that there's so much more to it than just picking up a controller or a mouse and a keyboard and putting a headset and playing. And that's good. But we've got a long way to go, Raphael, as you'll know. We need to keep these conversations going. We need to show the good case studies. We need to talk about the fact that students who come to esports courses turn up more often, succeed more often, and are happy more often you know and the more messages we can get out about that the more powerful it will be for parents absolutely agree that was really cool to, to hear from you and then uh, resuming something that you said uh, uh, before you were you are aiming to to find the talent in your country so then you pass from from students in the school then to college i don't know if you have reached people at the university level or not so the university level is covered, covered by two, two bodies, the new National University Esports League and the NSC, the National Student Esports uh, League or Championship. So they cover pretty much every university at this moment. So you, you tend to find uh, some filtering happening because you know how pros go. By the time you're 18, you've probably been found as a pro. So you're, you're in the college system or the school kit system when you get found to be a pro but if you're going kind of get picked up 19 20 you're quite late in your pro career for most games uh so you've already been identified in that early stage but we are uh next year rafa going to launch uh a nation's cup so that's going to be uh, the big esports titles in the uk to start with but hopefully wider as well where in so as you know the uk is split up with england northern ireland scotland wales where those nations can have internal cups to find the best player in Scotland. And we'll, we'll also find the best player in England. And then they will play against each other to be the champion. That will be open to professionals, to university students, to college and school students, to individuals who are at work. You might find a lawyer who thinks they're the best Call of Duty player in the world and entering that competition. So we're, we're going to do that. And we're starting to talk to other nations right now who like what we're doing and saying, actually, we might like to get involved in that. Maybe as, you know, this esports federation from this country, we'd like to participate in the Nations Cup. And that proves also be a talent identifier potentially because esports teams get their talent identification from communities, but they don't always pick up every talent. And we're going to find a fun way, but competitive way for people to get involved to win medals, to represent their country, to come up to the campus and be educated and trained and, you know, wear uh, kits from their country, all that amazing stuff that I think, um, and sorry, Rafa, just to come back to that, representation of country. So we did the Commonwealth Esports Championships uh, back in Birmingham in 2022. That was all over the news here in the UK. Uh, and we have the global esports games and different events. Parents find a lot more comfort in their children uh, and, and young adults competing in medal-based events than they're doing cash-based events. So when you suddenly got the BBC, which is a big news channel you know, institution here, showcasing 
um, participants who are about to compete in the Commonwealth Esports Championships attached to the Commonwealth Games, parents see a lot more synergy with that. Oh, you're going to represent Team GB or you're going to represent Team England and you could win a medal. You know, that's the next step, I think, in helping parents get a bit more comfortable with it rather than kind of in, you know, a dream hack event, which they don't really understand. They understand traditional sports models. Oh, you represent a country. You're going to go and represent that country in another country and lots of other countries. You're going to have a cultural exchange and you're going to, you know, wear your flag and maybe win a medal. So I think those things also are helping, particularly those of us who are a little older, help understand, you know, what, what this thing is, you know. That, that's that's a really good point. I mean, it, you are completely right. I mean, it's 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 just knowing how to touch the feeling of the fathers. Uh, but I completely agree with you, and I understand the situation. Uh, and so it's 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 an interesting way. Um, I want to talk about another important point, uh, and I want to highlight here in your website, which is women in esports. Right? Uh, mm. You talked before about. Uh, uh, let's make a brief resume. So. You are representing, uh, you are looking for talent. You have started going through schools, then uh, to college. Uh, you have done a lot of, in terms of uh, training yeah. or educating, better said, educating people, educating not only the, the students or the players, but families, people around. So everyone knowing the value of the esports, etc. You talk about something that is quite important right now, and it's one of the pains in our industry, which is toxicity, etc. So it's cool that some uh, some representative association as yours talk about this and let the people understand the way they should behave, et cetera, et cetera, right? So one of these points, it's about women in esports. I mean, you have a, a pretty much push in terms of including women in, in esports. So I would like to talk about a little bit, uh, what are you doing here and which are the, how to say, the the, the guidelines or the, or the actions that you are taking in order to promote the figure uh, of the woman in, in our industry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I want to start by saying this because I think it's really important. I don't want us to have a women in esports initiative in the long term. I hope, I very much hope we don't need it in the future. And so women, so there's been, as you know, uh, uh, an age old discussion, you know, why would you need w women's leagues, uh, open leagues, everyone can compete. I think here's what we understand at this moment in time is that, there is definitely a point in gaming where when it's partly to do with toxicity, partly to do with certain age ranges where we see a drop-off of female competitive participation. And some of that is they just give up. Some of it is that they go underground and they don't, they don't, they change their names in game. And they don't pr promote themselves as women because they suffer from some of this toxic abuse that we've talked about it, that goes spans social media and all kinds of this space, but is also prevalent in gaming and esports. Um, I've witnessed it. I've been involved in it. I play Call of Duty. I know what it's like when a, a, a young woman enters a, a lobby and the kind of uh, how they can be subjected and objectified by men. Uh, and if they if they play along and they're nice then everything's fine. But if they say no, suddenly, you know, people in that lobby can turn or if they're very good, they can also be, you know, suffer abuse. So I can totally understand why they might want to kind of turn away and not participate or pretend and not communicate. And therefore they can never be identified. What I know is this is that given the right platform, we will see female world champions participating in large open events. But we need to do a very similar thing. We need to, we need to educate everybody. You know, we, I'm just going through. It. We need to educate everyone and help them understand how we behave online, how good league and tournament infrastructure should be supported, help our esports teams to invest in in female participation, help brands be, help brands understand that you know there's a huge market. Um, relatively untapped in terms of brands and partnerships that could really help lift and uplift this ecosystem. So, so really importantly, we do the educating stuff. Then we're uh, absolutely about inspiring and empowering. So there are incredible women across this industry in all parts of it, from the gamers and the streamers 
to the operators, the entrepreneurs, the founders, the CEOs, wherever they are in the business. We need to shine a light on them. We need to give young women the people to look up to. And the people, and we need to make sure that businesses, esports organizations of all ilks, promote that talent, identify that talent through, uh, because it is with that promotion that a young, you know, 10, 11 year old uh, girl is going to look up and go, I want to be like her. And that's where I'm going to follow. And that's really important. It's also important for another reason is that there's some research that came out a few years ago, I think University of Surrey, but forgive me if I got that wrong, but I think it's University of Surrey that said 13 to 14 year old young women who game frequently actually end up being three times more likely to uh, be involved in STEM related subjects of so science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And when we look at how the world is going with the development of artificial intelligence and just in general, we need to make sure that we are, you know, we've tried for 20 years in our country to to broaden the amount of female participation in STEM related subjects. And here we are in esports and we've got something that could really move the needle. So we recognize that the ultimate aim of this, Raphael, is that in five years' time, we have we don't have women in esports uh, as a as an initiative. We have female world champions. Uh, we have female leaders, as we do now, but more of them at all levels. And that young women are as inspired to get involved in esports and the esports ecosystem as young men are right now, right? Because I think if you look through our education program, it's kind of eighty percent male uh, through the BTEC. And we need to get that more and more towards 50 because that's what we like more and more towards 50 percent. so how do we do it we shine a light we promote we look at ways to sponsor and enhance tournaments raise money we'll be looking at ways to create bursaries and other funds to support esports orgs that want to enhance and have genuinely innovative ways to enhance female participation in esports you know we're trying to build that bursary imagine being able to say well we don't have this right now, but imagine me I'd say we have a quarter of a million uh, pounds to support, you know, four organizations who can move the needle, a tournament organizer, a couple of esports teams, maybe some technology solutions, maybe an, an agency, a talent agency, a development agency. Imagine being able to do that and really lift it up. And what's really hard for me to, you know, because I'm a father of two girls and one boy, what I find really difficult is, what the amount of money that goes through the esports industry, you, you only need a fraction of that percentage of that to really move the needle for women in esports. So I really want to kind of advocate, you know, when these when all this money, sponsorships, brand, you know, all these kind of deals that go through, if you just if we could have just agreed collectively that like one percent of that would have focused on uplifting the female esports e ecosystem, we'd probably be miles ahead of where we were today. So we want to kind of find ways to do that. So that's why we set this up so that brands can come to it, partners can come to it, young women can come to it, young men can come to it and understand the viewpoint and we can educate and we can all drive the ecosystem up. That's amazing. I agree with you. There shouldn't be necessary to have these kind of initiatives, but right now it's the only way to to try to reach a, a situation where this is not going to be needed and that the woman will participate, as you said, we would we could have a female uh, woman championships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I completely agree with you. Uh, moving to another topic, uh, we were discussing before uh, started recording this session. Uh, or, or at, the, at the beginning, I said that that we are gonna we were going to have today the British Esports Association, which is the original name. Now you have now you have changed it. It's it's only British Esports, but now it's a federation instead of an association. Am I right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So why, what's driving the change? I mean, why changing from an association to the federation? What's the difference? I don't know if it's the same difference between an association and a federation here in Spain. Maybe it has another kind of meaning in the UK. I don't know. But why taking this step? Okay. Is it necessary yeah. for 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 the kind of things that you are doing right now? It's uh, what, what's the what's the what's the point? Yeah, so the, the actual only reason for the change for us, so so actually from a governance, because we're not a governing body, as you know, you know, the publishers are the governing bodies. So for, first, first of yeah. all, we have to say, sorry to interrupt, Dave, first of all, we have to say uh, that, and maybe you can explain it right now, that 
maybe when when we are referring in the name into the word federation this has not to be confused with the traditional federation for example in football federation or whatever that's the first point yeah. i should have to highlight yeah exactly so so the publishers are the governing bodies and um, we we found ourselves with a uh, an interesting situation around the Commonwealth Games, as I've described, which is that you had, uh, you've got, um, well, the Welsh Esports Association, you know, Esports Wales. You've got, you, we had there are associations around in different spaces, and, we, and T, uh, Team England needed to be established. So you needed the English Esports Association. You needed to have the uh, Northern Irish Esports. So they all needed associations. To affiliate under one body. So when you look at when you look at um, uh, traditional athletics, Team GB for the Commonwealth Games breaks down to be Team England, Team Wales, Team Scotland, Team Northern Ireland. So we said to ourselves, how do we, in effect, have this? We, we are the responsible body to the Commonwealth Games to the IOC, to the Global Esports Federation, when any of these events take place. So we changed our name to Federation, and then we have the uh, associations underneath. It isn't actually, there's operationally, we're doing nothing different to we were before, other than trying to create a separation to say, and it wasn't about control either, it was just about saying, well, here's the British Esports Federation, and here's the English Esports Association, you know, and Scottish Esports, Esports Wales, etc. And they all when it comes to tournaments, work with the the kind of core federation, which is British Esports Federation. We work very closely with all those organisations. Uh, we also work with them in a sense of making sure that we're not uh, keeping revenues. To, so we look at distribution models where everyone who participates is remunerated. We support them when they go to events. So it's about, but but it comes through us and then it's trickled down. So that that's what we did. So it isn't like a, like a football federation where we're suddenly making a play to, to govern in that sense. It was more about um, optically managing that through the Commonwealth Games. Yeah. Okay, understood. And then my next question should be something that we are seeing right now on the screen, which is the, <laughs> the first ever... European Olympic uh, eSports competition. So can you can you elaborate about this? Because there is a lot of confusion, you know, about uh, federations in the eSports are not the same as federations in, in uh, traditional sports, etc. Many people are talking about uh, eSports can become Olympic, etc. Et so I, I think or I understand from, from my point of view, right, that this has to has at least needs to have some kind of uh, explanation. Uh, many people tell me, no, no. Uh, esports are olympic and my my point is in yes and, and no yes in the sense that obviously the olympic committee etc we know we have known for a lot of time that they want to capture the people that it's running away from traditional sports and maybe also uh, traditional olympics right uh but at the same point and they know that one way of doing this is by giving the people what they the, the young people and precisely what they do right now which is Okay, uh, they are in Twitch, they are looking for streamers, etc., etc. So let's give them this content. But the point is that the games they use in order to to to, to generate this kind of eSports Olympics, etc., the, the, the games they use, the concept of eSports, I mean, I think it's not the same as the the main industry or the main it's not League of Legends, right? Industry, it's it's what they understand by esports, right? So there is a little bit of confusion yeah. in, in in this meaning in these words, and, and then I see this European Olympic uh, esports competition. So what is it about? Uh, are you going to play Counter Strike, League of Legends, or are you going to play I don't know a fishing game or whatever, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So so I think. Um... I think there's a couple of things. I, I want to start by, I suppose, setting the context of where we are, I think, right now and where I think we're going to be. And nobody knows exactly where we're going to be, right? Uh, even probably in the IOC, I'm sure they've got a vision for what they're going to do. Uh, but I think um, we we are in a really interesting moment right now. So that moment is where um, where the IOC, the Commonwealth, sport in general, is faced with an aging audience. 
And here we have this young, vibrant, tech-savvy esports audience. Um, but also, at the same time, sport is conflicted with what they see as the sedentary nature of gaming and esports and it, how it sits within the sports world. So what, what you saw kind of 18 months, two years ago, was that IOC announcing what they call the virtual esports series or the virtual sports series. And that was, like you say, that was kind of digital taekwondo or uh, Zwift or sailing or whatever it was going to be. And they launched that to, to be fair, quite a lot of mockery by the esports industry because none of those games anybody knew really anything about. There may have been a racing game in there, but again, the purest in esports would say sim racing games, that they're, they're there, but they're not in the top echelons of what's going on. Uh, and then the Commonwealth Esports Champion Championships came about and they were playing Dota and they were playing Rocket League and uh, they were playing, um, you know, what was Pro Evolution Soccer in terms of, in terms of uh, a game. And I think that was a step change because, as you know, Rocket League is a big game, you know, and Dota is a big game. So, and that was a very brave decision made by the Commonwealth at that particular moment in time because I think there was, you know, early stages conversations about similar kind of games. I think the Global Esports Federation, Paul Foster and Chester King and others did a, a really good job of saying, hey, if you if you genuinely want to start getting into esports, I know you're not going to start with Counter-Strike tomorrow because it's a very big step to take. But here are some games that, you know, are more family friendly, you know, more potentially like with Rocket League, it's football with rocket powered cars. Um, and, you know, so those... Those kind of things suddenly they aligned enough, but they also drew in an esports audience in a way that you know sailing's never going to do, right? So, so that was the kind of next step. And then what you saw quite quickly after that is the IOC announced Olympic Esports Week, which is going to happen um, in a few weeks' time uh, in Singapore. And again, if you look through the, the game titles, Rafael, a lot of them are kind of sports related titles right as it's very similar to the ones before with a few notable additions um gran turismo is in there which is you know a reasonably well played game but there's also a there's also a reimagined version of fortnite in there from the publishers now it's not fortnite as we know it but it is on the maps using target shooting so it's allowing some crossover between the kind of 400 million accounts of Fortnite and uh, and what the IOC wants to do. But as we can well imagine, with no disrespect to the IOC, it is a very traditional, um, very legis legislative entity that has to protect and try and negotiate with sporting governing bodies from all around the world and has something. So it needs to have a an entrance point. What I would say is this is, and I've said this on numerous forums, and I will say this to the IOC and others is, uh, if this is your way to start to soften, softly enter into esports, okay, okay, I understand it. But please don't try and measure this audience right now because you're not going after our audience. You are basically talking to if, if if somebody watches virtual taekwondo, they probably like taekwondo already, you know. So that's that's not gaining you a new audience. If you are basically making digital versions of the games that you play, most FIFA players here in England, we have a lot of FIFA players. They're football fans. The reason they play FIFA is so they can dream the dream they would have liked. Vale, creo, pensaba, pensaba que era yo, eh, a lo mejor el que, el que tenía un problema, pero creo que ha sido Chester el que se ha caído. Sí, efectivamente, no se escuchó a Adriana. Yo es que pensaba que era yo el que tenía el problema pero, y estaba viendo si cambiaba de red y demás, porque a veces me va un poco mal, pero creo que ha sido Chester el que se ha, el que se ha caído. ¿vale? Entonces, bueno, son cosas de, de, del directo, 
Vamos a intentar darle nada, un, bueno, un par de minutos o tres, porque yo creo que está bastante interesante la, eh, lo que está explicando, ¿vale? Eh, seguramente ahora se, se recupere la conexión y vuelva a entrar, así que nada, vamos a darle un par de minutos. Si queréis, incluso mientras tanto, y si alguien quiere ir haciendo alguna pregunta, eh, oye, pues eh, la puede hacer, si yo puedo responder, o si queréis incluso ir preparando las preguntas que le podamos hacer a, a Dave para cuando, para cuando se recupere, ¿vale? La conexión. Eh, pues estaría fenomenal. A mí entiendo que a mí sí que me estáis oyendo, ¿verdad? Si alguien me lo puede confirmar por el, por el chat eh, para saber que, que no estoy hablando solo y que no me he quedado solo, yo creo que sí me escucháis, ¿no? Eh, vale, vale, perfecto, Enrique, muchas gracias. Digo, a ver si ya estoy aquí yo. Nada, creo que ha sido eh, Dave, lo he dicho, vamos a darle un par de minutos, que estos días, eh, bueno, él está en UK, pero al final con lluvias y todo esto, al final se, es, un, es un desastre el tema de las conexiones. Eh, todavía hay mucho que mejorar, incluso para los eSports, así que nada. Eh, de, lo dicho, eh, si queréis dar un pa, eh, si queréis que comentemos alguna cosa aquí en, en directo y demás, si me queréis decir, oye Rafa, ¿le puedes preguntar esto a, a Dave ahora? Pues yo encantado, vamos a intentar terminar, o mi idea era terminar un poquito antes de lo que en España son las 9 menos 10, por aquello de que además precisamente hoy, eh, si, sois, bueno, si sois aficionados a los videojuegos, que entiendo que sí, sabéis que hoy es la presentación del Summer, Summer Fest, creo que se llama, eh, sabéis que estamos en una época de, de mucha presentación de temas de juegos, eh, es lo que antes era el E3, que era una de las mejores épocas para, para ver novedades en temas de videojuegos y demás, ahora se ha desagregado todo en, en, bueno, en diferentes, en diferentes eh, publishers, eh, y muy interesante, voy a continuar un poco yo mientras damos tiempo a Chester, pues muy interesante el tema de que estaba comentando él, que, que entiendo que lo habéis comprendido perfectamente, pero bueno, es muy interesante el, el hecho de decir, vale, eh, entendemos que, que, que esta última parte, entendemos que, que el, el COI, el Comité Olímpico Internacional, quiere aproximarse hacia los eSports, por lo que decía yo ¿no? en mi pregunta, porque al final es un público que les interesa, porque evidentemente, como decía Ch eh, Dave, el público de, de los, de, del deporte tradicional, pues al final está aumentando en edad, el público joven no es que no vea ese deporte tradicional, pero tiende mucho más a ver otro tipo de contenido. Y bueno, pues es, es evidente que tienen una atracción eh, hacia ese público y le quieren ofrecer algo. Lo que estábamos comentando es que los títulos que son eh, o que los títulos que se consideran eSports por parte de ese comité no se parecen o no son los que la propia industria de los eSports. Es decir, no esperéis ver, como decíamos, en esos, en esos, eh, en, en esos Juegos Olímpicos de los eSports eh, un Rocket League, un Dota, un Counter Strike o un League of Legends o un Valorant, ¿vale? Eh, y por eso también, y este es el punto que yo quería destacar que estaba diciendo Dave, lo que hay que hacer también es educar a ese Comité Olímpico Internacional, ¿no? Entonces es como, a ver si luego van a decir ustedes en una, digamos, en una comunicación generalista que los eSports no, no, no valen o no dan resultados, porque si lo que ustedes van a medir es la audiencia eh, de, lo que, de, lo que, de lo que ustedes han propuesto como juegos, pues es un poquito complicado que eso de audiencia, ¿no? Entonces, bueno, tenemos aquí ya de nuevo a Dave. Eh, está entrando. Let's see if we have uh, Dave back. Hello, Dave. Hey. Are you there? I'm so, I'm so sorry. We had a power cut. No, no so, problem. It happens. So where did I leave you? We were talking so about... You, the you were, I, I was trying to yeah. tell the people or, or discussing with the people a little bit about... Um, you were saying that it was, it's really important that, okay, uh, the Olympic International Committee is saying, let's go for this kind of eSports, that they are, you were talking about the, the example of Let's let's put in in this com uh, competition uh, digital taekwondo. But um, the point that you were st starting to discuss, and I agree completely with you, and I was discussing with the people in Spanish, is that let's tell the, these people that had th this idea that later on they cannot come and say, look, this thing about the esports doesn't work because really what you are doing or what you are proposing it's not what we understand as esports, and you cannot pretend to have the audiences that we have in what we call esports like Call of Duty, League of Legends, Dota 2, etc., etc., by putting people to watch digital taekwondo, right? <laughs> That's the point. Yeah. And they have yeah. to know this, because later they cannot say that esports are not giving them audiences. Yeah. That would be false. I think, I think you've seen sports teams enter esports trying to play games like FIFA and wondering why their audience hasn't got bigger. Well, they're the same, same people. They're the ones who come to your ground uh, who are playing FIFA. That's how it happens. So uh, like you say, this is really important, but you have to walk a very uh, legislative, bureaucratic organization through the process. And the IOC takes a long time, but it's moving in the right direction. So what 
you, what we hope is that by LA, Los Angeles 2028, where there is a swathe of esports teams very close by, that there will be something more like an esports event that the communities that we know would engage with. Now, whether that's a full medal event, I'd like to think that we could see that by that time. But even if it isn't, even if it is a significant showcase of significant esports titles connected to the Olympics, that is the next stage. I agree. I would say this, though. Esports doesn't need the Olympics as much as I feel Olympics needs esports. Mm -hmm. But I do think there are opportunities that esports gets from being involved in Olympic type events like a widening brand partnership cycle because brands start to see more validity because it's connected to such prestige as the IOC and other entities. Also, I think it's a massive, if if you've got your, you know, your Spanish dads, you describe them and their kids are going off to represent Spain at the Olympics, <laughs> you can see the change in the thought process at that point. So I think they're, they're, they're the important thing. So, so this, this European uh, EOC, the European uh, the European Olympics Committee sanctioned event, is a step in the right direction. Again, it's Rocket League, it's uh, it's uh, eFootball, and it's also it has an element of connection to the players and the events going on. So I think there's going to be some involvement in things like the closing ceremonies. It's in the same space, so it's it's you know just kind of gently. Gently, gently coming closer together. Um, but the real important bit, Raphael, is the bit you've described to everyone there, is they need to know how, why, and when to measure everything and the success elements of everything. Because without that, you are, um, you, you're going to have a real false start. And everyone's going, oh, we tried we tried esports, but it didn't work for us. Yeah. Which, which, is, which is, in fact, what's happening with some brands, that they do not know how to enter into the esports. They think it's exactly. not a cool uh, industry, etc., and it's because they do not know how to do the things in the field, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I would like to 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 end. Uh, uh, I would like to end a little bit earlier than usual because you know uh, we are talking about uh, esports, we are talking about games, and today in 18 minutes we have a huge event, which is the Summer Fest, where a lot of games are supposed to be presented today. So my last question, and then if people have uh, any questions, they will be they will have time to do it. Uh, it's a completely different uh, question regarding anything that we have already tweeted, but it's something that <clears throat> I would like to understand. And you know that when we do our classes in in our master, a lot of people talk, uh, ask the, about this question, which is something I, I I think it's interesting. So the point is. First of all, congratulations for everything that you have achieved uh, with the with the British eSports. That's the reason why I always want you to to be here in these kind of sessions, workshops, etc. Because I think it's really cool. They, and, and I don't know if it's the biggest achievement or not, but surviving for seven years, <laughs> it's something amazing. And the question is, how do you do it in terms of money? I mean, how are you funded? Because people may be thinking, these people are doing this all this kind of things they are progressing they are growing etc etc where do they obtain the money from do you yeah. obtain the money from your associates uh, or how do you do it because again going back to the to the attempts that we had in spain the idea was okay we are going to be funded part uh, from grants from the government which is a complete fail which, which was a complete failure right and the other one was okay let's let's tell the associates that uh, they will have to pay like a quote like a subscription, you can call it a per month, right? But the question for, for these people that want to be associated is, and what do I obtain for? Uh, mm -hmm. payments, right? So in the end, it was a complete disaster. So the, the, the key question here for someone who can be uh, watching us and saying, look, I mean, it would be something interesting to have a federation or association. You have to bear in mind that um, uh, we are talking about Madrid in game, which is in Spanish or Madrid in concrete uh, initiative, but a lot of people from other uh, countries talk, uh, speaking Spanish are are watching or will be watching this video. And in these countries, maybe the, the the point about the federation or whatever is not so extended yet. And maybe they will be wondering, okay, that's amazing. We would like to do something like the British eSports. How do we do it? Which is where, where do you obtain the money to do all these kind of things? Yeah. If, if I can make if I can make the question right, <laughs> yeah, always, always. So I think. It's a moment now to recognize a few things. The first thing 
when it recognises that when Chester saw this endeavour, he knew that he would need to fund this from his own pocket for a while. I don't think he quite realised he'd need to fund it for as long as he did. Uh, and that should be recognised, you know, certainly in our industry for the commitment that he's made to that, because it isn't insignificant, right? Staff and uh, operations and all of those kind of things. However, we've done that now so that other federations don't need to do that. We've trialed and tested many different models to get to where we've got to today. I think if I'm starting up that federation today, I'm launching a few things very quickly. I'm looking at education partnerships at university level and uh, high school, college, high school level, right? There are, uh, we get revenues from students who participate in courses in the partnership. So we write course material, we bring course experts together, we provide credibility to schools and colleges and education institutions by our name and our brand in the space. So that's just a simple, that's one of the revenue streams that we start to develop. Then uh, obviously because of the time served and our success, there are now consultancy opportunities where different governments, federations, parts of industry want our expertise whether it's about talking to brands, whether it's about setting up a federation, whether it's about something they're trying to do in the esports space. So for a period of time, we gave away all those services for free to build up our reputation. Um, I don't think we ever needed to. I think, you know, if you have a federation, if you want to set, sorry, before that, if you set up a federation tomorrow, you need some good people from the esports industry to, to get, hit the ground running because they can be consultants, advisors, support. So that's a, a, an element to our business. Obviously, now with the uh, the campus, uh, and we'll talk, we can talk about it another time, but this is going to be the physical location we're going to have. That's going to be a revenue generator. There are going to be different ways that people can interact, whether it's professional teams paying to utilize facilities or brands wanting to activate. There's revenue in there. And then the fourth one, which is now becoming uh, significant to us, that I mentioned to you earlier, are key brand partnerships. So today we announced a deal with Dell, uh, Intel and Alienware. That's a two year deal. It's a very significant deal for us, uh, both in terms of um, support commercially, uh, financially, but also in kit for our campus. Uh, but we are also at uh, high level discussions with a bank, uh, a very well known global bank with a very well known tel telecommunications partner with uh, F. Uh, fast moving consumer goods partners, the kind of people that provide food and drink and all these different. So we we are now at a point where all of these different uh, interactions are happening and they are going to enhance the revenue. And all of that put together is how we make our money. We don't take a penny from the government. We don't have a membership system for the esports organizations or, or anybody who wants to get into it to pay us. In the fullness of time, we want to launch with IBM a safer space for young people to interact. That will be a paid for service, um, and which will generate a revenue for our federation and potentially other federations that want to use the platform. We'll also do that through coaching standards and creating better coaching. But we don't, yeah, we've never taken a penny from government. We've never taken a penny from, you know, the community in terms of what we do. We also try our best to make sure that when, sponsorship deals come through we pass them to the teams into the ecosystem because so we've passed many more sponsorship deals we've done one sponsorship deal the one we've announced today everyone else who comes to us as a brand we say go and talk to fanatic or excel or guild or whoever it's going to be these are the teams you should be talking to so um it's been a long road um but i think if you if you start this journey today you don't have to take as long as we do and and cost as much as we do to get there but we are now definitely in a position where, you know, the respect for our federation and, and you know, again, you know, to Chester and everyone else behind it, um, it's it's on their their expertise and their commitment. We're, we're now considered to be, you know, one of those federations that if you're thinking about doing some of the esports, you want to come and work with and connect with. So that's how we did it. So that that's amazing. Congratulations. And, and a lot of a lot of long hours and sleepless nights and everything else, right? So you know effort and and commitment and pa passion is really important. Absolutely. Knowing your industry very well, talking to lots of people, thousands of Zoom and team pools, you know, that we have, all of that is really important. 
So that's, as I was saying, that's really amazing. Uh, congratulate, first of all, congratulations for everything that you have achieved, and Dave. And second, we have to give you thanks because, as you said, probably if someone comes and try to repeat this, they are not going to lose time with the steps that they already know that they are not going to work, right? So thank you very much for everything that you have offered to the ecosystem. So if, if someone has a question, now it's the moment to do it. Uh, you have a few seconds while I try to to say goodbye to, to Dave. Uh, Dave, it's always a great pleasure to, to talk with you, to understand what's Thank going you. on. I've had the opportunity, I don't know, but in our master project, you have been in the last, I don't know, six, seven, eight editions. That means around four years. So I had the opportunity to, through through every edition and through every yeah. class master class with you to know better and to understand and, and know what's going on and how you have evolved the, 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 the association. So um, really thanks for having for having the chance and for having the time to come here and to talk uh, about the, how you have done these things uh, here in this workshop in Madrid in game. Uh, congratulations again for everything that you have done. Keep pushing because I think um, you are a, apart from being the UK uh, representative, uh, let's let's call it that way. You are a really important part from the from the eSports ecosystem in general. I think that many other federations, associations, whatever you want to call them, they should have to to look at you and say, look, I mean, this is the correct way to do it because the results are already there, right? Uh, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So I, when I, the only thing I can I can say is once again, thank you very much for being with us. Congratulations for everything thank that you have achieved, and uh, keep pushing and keep working. Uh, you know that we were discussing before we started recording that. Probably we are not in the best times of eSports or whatever industry, I would say, right? Mm -hmm. But with people so so professional as yours uh, and with this passion that you already mentioned, which I agree with you, it's absolutely essential, right? Um, I know that everything is going to be okay. Adriana is saying in the chat that thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. Thank you. It has been very interesting. So thank you very much, uh, Adriana, for the comment. Right. Brilliant. And thanks for having me. It's always great. I, I love coming and talking. It's, it's fantastic. Sometimes it's really good just to talk about all the things we're doing. And if you had a call from three or four years ago, how much has changed, right, in yeah, the last three or four years? And, you know, no one was talking about EOC and IOC and virtual yeah. sports. And, you know, back then there's millions of dollars for esports teams and everyone's talking about will they be successful or not? And, you know, Absolutely. You know in four years' time, we'll be talking more, I'm sure. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? But we will be here to talk about these things in, in four years' time, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much, Dave. And I hope to see you again really soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone, for being here and for the ones who will be watching this video recorded in YouTube. Uh, keep, keep watching YouTube because we are going to have more workshops with other important people from the industry. And that's all for today. Thank you very much. Everyone, thank you, Dave. Uh, see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.